Good morning or good afternoon to uh, everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome all of you to this, uh, to the first of four uh, meetings that we have to, let's say, uh, organize in substitute of the usual Frankfurt conference that we are having at uh, SAFE. And the first of these four meetings is focusing on the next generation uh, program. So pretty much the European response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, the main objective of this meeting is to uh, contribute to uh, understand better uh, how this uh, next generation plan uh, is, uh, uh, is going to be set up. And uh, we are discussing this topic with uh, four, uh, let's say, experts on, uh, uh, on this under different perspectives. So I'm going to introduce uh, the first one that is uh, Jacob von Weizsäcker, uh, that is uh, having several roles and is also you know, very relevant for uh, this, uh, this plan. Uh, he is a German economist and a politician who uh, is also serving as chief economist at the German Ministry of Finance. Uh, you know, he was also elected from 2009 for 2014 uh, in the European Parliament, and uh, he is uh, very active under different dimension on on this topic. The second speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Marco Buti. Uh, he is uh, he was till last year from 2000 from December 2018 the Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs at the European Commission, and is now Chief of the Cabinet of Gentiloni. Uh, so pretty much, you know, is also uh, contributing to uh, the idea of how to set up this plan. Uh, then we have uh, Cor Professor Cornelia Wall that uh, he's professor at, uh, of political science uh, uh, and co-director of the Max Planck Science Po Center at uh, Science Po University. Uh, and he's also you know, a researcher at the Center for European Studies and Cooperative Politics and the Laboratory for Interdisciplinary Evaluation of poli Public Policies. Uh, she's uh, working a lot on uh, several topics, but clearly this one will be from the political point of view, uh, uh, an important topic. And she's going to give us uh, a, a view from this perspective of this plan. Uh, then we have Professor Marty Subramanian that actually is very early for him. So thank you very much for waking up so early. So he is professor of finance and economics and international business at Stern School of Business uh, at New York. York University, and is also Global Network Professor of Finance at NYU Shanghai. Uh, he holds a degree in mechanical engineering and he get the PhD at MIT, where the supervisor wore uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, um, Robert Merton. His research is very, let's say, uh, general and is including valuation of corporate securities, asset pricing, market microstructure, fixed income markets. He's having more than 100 publications and he edited several books uh, uh, during his long career. And he's also uh, in touch with, let's say, um, uh, practitioners because he's uh, also served as a consultant in, uh, for several years and he's also a member of several boards. So he will give us a different perspective. The one of the academics, the one from, uh, uh, let's say, the US and how, you know, pretty much the US is responding versus how uh, Europe is responding to this pandemic. And also, you know, from uh, the from the, as a par practitioner as well, what, let's say, um, the practitioner may think about uh, the type of proposal that has been set up uh, uh, by, by the European Commission. But I'm not going to take any more time. So uh, I'm leaving now the floor to Jacob that uh, you know, is going to explain to us better what is the uh, next generation program and plan. Thank you very much. Juliana, thank you very much. Uh, um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here on this uh, distinguished panel. Um, and um, I think what I co can contribute as, uh, um, as an official from the German Ministry of Finance is to perhaps start by uh, saying what is different this time around. Because, of course, we have a reference um, 10 years ago, uh, over 10 years ago, um, uh, and the financial crisis. And of course, it was a different crisis and the response was different. 
And uh, I think one useful starting point is to wonder, well, why is the response different to what it was 10 years ago? And of course, part of it has to do that we learned certain things from the last crisis, but more importantly, this crisis is different. And I think it's different in three dimensions. The first dimension is this is a natural catastrophe. Um, it uh, is a natural catastrophe that came over us. And um, since, of course, uh, we have uh, two Italians on the panel, make, let me make it very clear. Um, Germany was lucky that we were a little bit behind in the infection dynamics uh, initially, which gave us valuable, maybe it was just 10 days, but very valuable time to um, you know, try and respond to this natural catastrophe, um, uh, which uh, of course the countries which were first it did not have. And so it is a natural catastrophe and by and large, the differences in infection dynamics are to an important extent linked to luck, bad luck or slightly better luck, but bad luck anyway, because uh, it's a disaster, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, and so, um, uh, what is different is that um, people, for good reason, decided this is not a crisis um, where moral hazard plays a role. It's more like an earthquake. Um, and it is an earthquake that uh, binds us together because infection dynamics, they're, of course, a cross border um, dynamics. Um, and it is something where either we rise to the challenge together as the European Union um, or we don't. Um, and uh, that, I think, was a very different starting point uh, from the crisis 10 years ago. And it enabled um, the deployment of the next generation e EU fund. And um, uh, we're, we're still finalizing, as you know, uh, the negotiations in the German um, uh, Council presidency has, has a role to play there. And we hope uh, that we manage uh, to um, uh, finalize this so that it can actually start. In, in early 2021, but um, so, so that's what's making this possible. It's a catastrophe that came over us and we have to um, go through this together in solidarity. And this solidarity, and it's clear to everybody, is also insurance because we don't know that there are countries where the first wave was less severe and where all of a sudden the second waves, take a, a, a country like the Czech Republic, the second wave is very severe. See, we, we don't actually know where we'll come out of this. And so it's solidarity, it's insurance, it's Europe standing together. And that's the first uh, important difference. The second important difference is, of course, our perception. And I think the reality of geopolitics is different today than it was 10 years ago. Um, and I think uh, in, in, in the European Union, we've come to realize we are living in a more complicated environment uh, than uh, perhaps people were, were fully aware of 10 years ago. And that also has meant that beyond uh, the immediate uh, problem of uh, the um, uh, COVID-19 crisis, there was a sense that uh, either um, Europe um, manages uh, to stick together um, or we are in a very difficult spot. Um, and that's also ge geopolitical observation. And thirdly, um, that's uh, um, uh, sort of more an economist's perspective that is not necessarily widely shared, but did play a, an important role in the technical discussions. Uh, we are um, at or even below the zero lower bound in terms of monetary policy. So um, fiscal is not the only game in town, but it is more important uh, um, uh, um, uh, when, when, when you're at the zero lower bound. Uh, and so it was felt um, this um, very sizable fiscal initiative, given the macro environment that we find ourselves in now, is appropriate. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, um, having said this, if this is the point of departure, these are the three differences. That's what's helping us to come together um, uh, as a European Union in this crisis. Uh, then the question emerges, well, what do you do with the money? Um, and obviously, uh, it would not be a good idea, and uh, Marco Butti and the European Commission, they're not trying to do that, um, to try and micromanage the crisis response. But to give countries a, um, a sense that um, moving out of the crisis, it's this sort of um, the slogan, build back better, 
moving out of the crisis, there's an, there, there are enough fiscal resources available to invest in energy transition, to invest in digitization, to invest into a better future. Um, I think that was a good choice. Um, and incidentally, uh, it, it is the kind of choice that you see in, for example, US fiscal federalism, uh, where a lot is done by the center, Washington, or in this case, the center Brussels, by means of so-called tied grants, where the center gives money provided that member states um, uh, uh, undertake certain activities that are perceived to be, and uh, I think they are, um, in the interest of us all. Um, for example, managing energy transition is in the interest of every me member state, but it's a, also a joint objective where there's true European value added. And in fact, if I may add this, global value added um, to, to actually move forward. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting development to reinforce. It, 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 it exists in the European uh, budget philosophy, but this idea of tied grants, I think, is, is very important. But it's not micromanaging. Um, Marco Butti uh, and the others involved in this in Brussels, they're not going to tell us in detail what we have to do. So it places a lot of responsibility. Uh, and I think that's also worth mentioning on member states to do things that not only look good uh, um, right now in their recovery and resolution plans, but where with hindsight, um, uh, everybody in Europe is going to be able to say, well, this was money well spent. It was not only a good idea at the time, but it, with hindsight, it was a hugely successful project. And um, uh, if one moves beyond the reflection, well, why do we have um, the next generation EU plan um, in the present crisis? And then ask the questions, what are the wider possible wider implications for the future? of this project, which is not mainly on people's mind, but it's also on people's mind. And I think it's also a question that we're going to be discussing on this panel. The immediate, uh, uh, of course, uh, repercussion would be, if this is successful, if um, and not only the idea was good, but the implementation is good, that places enormous responsibility on every member state involved, then chances are that this is going to be repeated if a, 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 some similar or different crisis is going to hit us because people are going to say, well, this was a success and not a failure. And uh, uh, so, so it's a huge responsibility on all of us to make sure that this is a su success. Beyond that, there are important elements where I think this can really um, move us towards, um, and that's a longer run process, the creation of the European Treasury. As part of the summit uh, conclusions, of course, um, there, there were indications of um, how to fund the project, how to service uh, the uh, our joint debt that will be issued as part of that next generation EU. Um, it was a discussion of own resources and the question, should there be certain tax resources made available directly to the center? That would be a huge uh, um, institutional step. Um, and it's clearly part of the agenda. Um, and so that, that, that would be uh, quite significant. It is significant that the um, uh, debt, um, uh, European debt existed before. Um, uh, I'm sure Marco Buti will tell us more about it, but this is a, an order of magnitude bigger. So that's uh, um, trying out how, how it will actually work um, is a huge step. And the one step, of course, uh, uh, there was talk of a Hamiltonian moment uh, the one step, uh, of course, that is not included in the present package, but in the longer run, if we want to create a European treasury that actually works well, um, uh, we would also need certain uh, uh, adjustments to the governance. Because, of course, one of the reasons why um, there's a there was a political decision um, and now it takes so much time to implement it, and hopefully we'll manage, is, is that all of this is governed by unanimity. Um, and it's difficult to run a modern, modern treasury in the long run if everything is governed by unanimity. And it's also uh, difficult to be successful in the long run if there is not institutionally a, a finely balanced uh, um, a, a setup that makes sure we have um, a, a solidarity 
and responsibility in a balance that doesn't create a lot of moral hazard in the long run. And, and so um, uh, my hope would be in conclusion that uh, looking back at this um, many years from now, we will say this was a pivotal moment in the creation of a European treasury. And therefore, perhaps we would even be able to say it was a kind of Hamiltonian moment, but for what, what it's worth right now, this is a large sized, impressive, certainly not perfect, but uh, I think appropriate uh, crisis response that we now need to put into practice and, and that we need to make a success uh, so that people realize uh, um, Europe it really is a part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for being on time, my, my compliment. And I think that you touched several interesting points, but I want to move uh, immediately to uh, Marco that is going, you know, also to stress again, uh, some aspect that you already, uh, let's say pointed. And the first one is that it is an extremely ambitious program. So what are the challenges then? Thank you very much, uh, Loriana. Uh, happy to be here. Actually, not happy to be here where I am, huh? uh, because uh, it would have been nice to be uh, to be together. Hopefully, it will uh, it will happen again. But nice to be all connected uh, to exchange views, and very happy to come after uh, Jacob's introduction. Uh, and I have to say that um, uh, if I had to play a role of discussant, I would be extremely boring because uh, I basically agree with uh, uh, everything that he has uh, said, including the insipid, which is, uh, uh, I mean, people like uh, Jacob and myself, uh, having gone through the uh, financial crisis, uh, which started in 2008, tend to relate uh, to that type of experience which I think is uh, mutatis mutandis extremely helpful uh, to do, also to highlight uh, the commonalities, what we have learned, but also the uh, differences. The point uh, he makes uh, on the different nature of the crisis, I think is, uh, is a fundamental one. All the arguments about moral hazard have gone out of the window in this uh, uh, crisis, um, in the margin of this crisis here, which I think helped uh, um, helped a lot. I think it's very important also uh, the um, uh, concept of solidarity not being a, a unilateral uh, you know, act of generosity, but, uh, but seen as, uh, as you know, um, actually enlightened self-interest and, uh, uh, and insurance. For this, I recall a very beautiful uh, definition of solidarity by Junger Habermas, who actually says precisely that in political economy terms, not in economic terms, but seeing solidarity as you know, entering into a contract in which this time is up to a certain group of countries to uh, show solidarity vis-a-vis -vis others, but knowing that uh, the same will happen in the future, in case of uh, you know the a shock being uh, hitting uh, hitting others, so I think this is a, it's a very important uh, uh, element, and also very much in uh, agree with uh, Jacob on the fact that we have to use uh, the money uh, very effectively, uh, and it is uh, you know we should uh, we should uh, use it in a transformative way. So this is um, just to uh, a couple of comments on the. Uh, on uh, his uh, introduction. Let me go back to um, uh, a moment to the, uh, to the context uh, and uh, uh, to explain briefly what is the, the program is about. I think it's useful to start from uh, the, our um, uh, assessment of the outlook. We published the economic forecast uh, actually last week. Uh, and you know, beside the, the numbers, we know this is, uh, is a huge shock. What are the key messages uh, that uh, mm, uh, I elicit out of, uh, of the autumn forecast of the Commission? Three, essentially. The first one is that uh, uh, it's a huge shock in the short term, but with legacies. And, 
And in fact, uh, in our forecast, by the end of 2022, we, that's the time span of the, of the forecast, the euro area as a whole will have not gone back to the level of GDP pre-crisis 2019. And actually, it will be about four to five percentage points uh, below what would have been the trend uh, growth of, uh, uh, of, the, of the economy uh, in the pre, uh, with the pre-crisis uh, trend. Second point, the shock is common in origin, but is very differentiated in outcomes. So this, you'll see that you you see that there is a, uh, you know countries reacting very differently. Uh, I think there are studies here by our common friends Jacob and, uh, of Jacob and myself, Andre Sapir, who has shown actually that um, the structure of the economy, um, the uh, intensity of the crisis, then lockdown measures, but also also very important, the quality of governance explains the the uh, differentiated outcome of the uh, of the shock third point is that there is a cyclical divergence but this is superimposed onto a structural divergence so if i take the whole period uh now uh, or uh, let's say 2021 with the bouncing back that we are foreseen modest because we have the second wave but bouncing back nonetheless and the level of GDP pre-financial crisis, so 2008. So if we take a longer term view, we have, uh, uh, you know, Germany is going to be something like 12 points above the level of 20, uh, 2008. Italy, to take the extreme and others are falling between, is still 9 percentage points below the level of 2008. So there is an issue of divergence in the short term, but also structural divergence in the longer term. So these are the, I think, the main messages. And I think we can look at the, uh, the typology of response at the European level, uh, next generation EU, and within that, the recovery resilient facility through this prism of, uh, so size matters clearly, uh, because uh, we have to respond to a huge shock. So the 750 billion of next generation EU, which I recall comes on top of uh, uh, the other uh, measures taken by the Eurogroup, uh, um, uh, sure, which is uh, you know help to short time short uh, time work. We have the EIB, we have the pandemic facility on the uh, of the ESM. Overall, more than 500 billion potential potential you know of uh, cheap uh, um, loans uh, 750 is in part loans in part transfers so this is an important uh, uh, component not to talk about the um, ECB the PEP program uh, 1350 uh, billion so I think overall a massive uh, uh, response and and Jacob is right in indicating that one of the things that we learned from the financial crisis is that we cannot put all the onus on the shoulders of the ECB. So we need to have a more balanced policy mix. And I think this is, uh, I want to make uh, just a, a reference in brackets, I think is also, let's put it like that, Karlsruhe compatible uh, uh, to, to make reference to, to the, uh, to the um, uh, judgment of the, uh, of the court. So not to leave all the responsibility on the on the part on the uh, on the ECB. Second point, which is very important, also learned from the financial crisis, is that we cannot achieve a proper fiscal stance for the eurozone as a whole simply by a coordination of uh, national uh, uh, fiscal policies. So, an element of vertical coordination between uh, uh, the center, so the EU budget, and national budget. I think is vital uh, in this case, and I think that's what we are trying to put uh, in place. The uh, core of next generation EU is the recovery and resilient facility. I point to the two R's, recovery and resilience. So recovery clearly, so helping out 
let's say, in the short term, so in the course of next year to tackle the crisis, but also resilience. I mean, so meaning that you have to tackle the actual structural bottlenecks that have uh, um, made some uh, countries more fragile compared to the to others, and to tackle those structural divergences, which, as I mentioned before, accumulated over the longer uh, the longer term. So um, this means uh, responding in practice, responding to the country-specific recommendation within the EU semester from a national viewpoint, and make it making it the response compatible with the double transition. Uh, so in a transformative way, the uh, climate uh, uh, and environmental transition and the digital one, so that we um, we come out of this crisis stronger than, uh, than before. What are the conditions to for success? Uh, and that is my final words. Okay, the first one, the program has to be adopted uh, because we had the, the uh, agreement uh, at the political level in uh, July. Uh, since then, uh, there has been a lot of wrangling. We know that we need to have the European Parliament on board. We need to have the uh, member states on board because after that, there will need to be national ratifications because for the Commission to go out and borrow the 750 billion, we need to have new uh, uh, adoption of the ceiling of own resources, which would allow to, uh, which would provide a guarantee for the union to go and borrow in the markets. Uh, and that has to go through national ratifications. And we know that the, the um, hurdles that we have seen uh, in the past days, including yesterday on uh, rule of law uh, with a veto by Hungary and Poland, which will have to be uh, overcome. In, in that sense, we are extremely lucky to have the German uh, Germany at the helm of the European uh, Union presidency, because I think they are the best uh, positioned in order to overcome these uh, uh, vetoes. Uh, so first of all, adopt the program. And the second one is, uh, um, pres on, and this is the onus on the member states, present credible national recovery and reform programs, which respond to the requirements that I've indicated before. Uh, on this, uh, uh, we have given the, the opportunity to countries who so wish to present program in, you know, draft programs as of mid-October. Five countries have done that. Uh, other countries have presented parts of, uh, of programs to have an interaction with the European Commission so that when, next, uh, as of beginning of next year, till next spring, there will be formal submission of programs, the ground had been labored in sense already uh, so that we can have a speedy um, speedy adoption or any implementation of the program themselves so quite a lot of work in front of us i think is a, a, i agree uh, we had the opportunity to discuss with jacob in other fora on on resources european treasury um, i tend to characterize this as potentially more of a Rooseveltian moment, uh, uh, thinking about the New Deal, or and uh, uh, rather than a Hamiltonian moment, Hamilton, especially in maybe in Germany, recalls a bit the assumptions of uh, a legacy debt on the part of uh, you know southern countries, the U.S. We are not talking; we are issuing common debt. We are not taking over uh, legacy debt, which remains firmly under the responsibility of the member states. So, but, but this is a question of, uh, of you know, terminology that is um, that, that we can that we can discuss at a more historical level. Thanks a lot. Okay. So thank you very much also for being on time. Uh, very interesting, let's say, uh, points that I think that you know. Uh, Cornelia maybe can try to address uh, one of the aspects that uh, clearly on one side is uh, very positive because, uh, you know, Europe faces still the crisis legitimacy problem. We have a lot of issue, you know, on the fact that uh, some member states uh, uh, or some some people inside the different member states, you know, were uh, putting in, uh, in question leg the legitimacy of, of Europe. And the question I'm asking to Cornelia is how pretty much this uh, new plan is helping to, uh, you know, 
to help us to have at the end a, a really a European Union. Yes, thank you, Lauriana, and thank you very much for uh, allowing me to participate in this very interesting discussion. Um, for political scientists, democratic legitimacy is hugely important for the long-term viability of political projects. And with Next Generation EU, we have a very, very interesting plan that responds to a lot of the concerns we saw during the management of the sovereign debt crisis. And I also make that parallel because it is quite helpful to compare the two. So we uh, generally distinguish between different types of political legitimacy. And we uh, consider that there's one aspect which is what uh, a policy produces, its so-called output. And another one, which is who has participated in, in producing the policy and that we call input following Fritz Schaub. And uh, more recently, Vivian Schmidt has added a so-called throughput legitimacy. It's quite an ugly word, but it refers to the process and procedures of accountability and transparency. And the EU is, uh, uh, in terms of its main achievements, quite strong on outputs, peace, prosperity, free movement, but it has never been a role model for democratic decision-making because it's always been stuck halfway between an intergovernmental organization and somewhere of a more integrated federal system. And what is more in times of economic hardship, European aid has severely restricted the democratic process at the national level in the name of technocratic principles or conditions tied to aid. And this has resulted uh, for a lot of uh, analysts in, in these very virulent backlash that we've seen more recently as a corollary of the um, opposition to the politics of austerity or what's sometimes called the bureaucratic monster in Brussels or the EU as a machine of liberalization. These are all the different notions. And what distinguishes uh, next generation EU from uh, European aid mechanisms uh, during the sovereign debt crisis is that it provides greater room for national political de deliberation. It decentralizes with some guiding principles, but it decentralizes. And it is less based on strict and intrusive uh, policy conditionality, or as Jakob von Weizsäcker said, micromanaging uh, what goes on in each of these countries, uh, which have uh, more dominated the sovereign debt crisis that uh, was very rule-based and, and very much government also by stealth, where a lot of conditions had to be met, but they didn't become part of political discussions at the national level. So what uh, we've seen in the sovereign debt crisis is that this uh, old solution created difficulties both in the debtor and in the creditor countries for national politics, for the um, debtor countries, the aid was too restrictive and did not go far enough. And in the creditor countries, the burden on its own citizenry was conceived as too heavy, too unjust, and there was this issue of moral hazard, which was there very dominant. And I agree that this uh, problem of imagining the politics at the national level of a, a European solution has been lifted during the COVID-19 crisis because the crisis is shared possibly not in results, but in origin. It is bad luck. Uh, it affects all countries. It's hopefully limited in time. That's what we're working around right now. So it's no longer uh, predicated on just lowering boring costs for some, but it is uh, mutualizing them. We will all carry the costs of this crisis together because we are all affected by this crisis. And this means that uh, the crisis allows us to break with a very strict reciprocity logic and move towards a more broadly defined, it's been mentioned, self-interest, enlightened self-interest for each member state. As long as the EU can go out stronger, we can all find an advantage. And uh, in the initial period where, all country, where, where money is raised collectively, everybody will receive some of the money and be able to help specifically its, its own citizens. And the fact that the balancing of the budget is also stretched out of a very long period makes the, the bean counting, the reciprocity calculations that you will always see in politics much less um, uh, relevant. So this is another element that has allowed to break this. We will have funding that if it goes through, it will come from increased own resources. We will have possibly new EU-wide taxes. And so there's much more room for domestic priorities, even if the grants are tied. It's an interesting solution to have a tied grant principle. Um, but the, this is nowhere as close and as uh, intrusive as the strict uh, conditionality we had on loans previously. And the mix is quite interesting, but the grants are the most important part of, this, of the budget. So in terms of decentralizing and solving some of the uh, legitimacy problems we've seen, I think this has gone a very far part of the way. Good, 
Very good. And I'm moving then to Marty exactly on this point, you know. So the approach, it seems that, uh, you know, the European Commission is address is trying to implement is uh, a bottom up approach. So, you know, uh, more at the micro level, all the different countries are knows very well what are their problem and they are proposing, uh, let's say, how they are going, you know, to implement this plan. So what, what is your view and how the US instead are, are, are doing it? And on the other side, what do you think from uh, uh, that we should get from this type of program also in the way in which we are going to finance and support uh, small and medium enterprises because they are you know, the backbones of, of, of Europe as they are also for the US, by the way. Thank you, Loriana. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to me to, for, to be on this panel, um, a distinguished panel, albeit at this early hour for me. Uh, I will talk about three different issues. Uh, the first one is uh, the structure of the financing. Uh, and I'll view this in the context of both what has happened in the US and elsewhere, and also try to comment on the European perspective. Um, and the second thing I'll talk about is really, again, from an outsider's uh, viewpoint, uh, the, the, the merits of this European solution rather than uh, a piecemeal national solution. And the third issue that I'll talk about, and that's not received as much attention as it deserves, is really the fragility of banks, particularly in Europe. Um, let me talk about the, the structure of financing, and that's something that uh, several of us, including Loriana, have uh, wor worked on over the course of the pandemic uh, period. Uh, and that is really uh, what kind of claims should be used to finance uh, those in trouble, whether they are households or small firms or medium-sized firms or large firms. Indeed, every type of entity in the system has been very badly affected by the crisis some more so than others. And really the type of assistance um, is really extremely important. Traditionally, in times of crises, all across the world, governments have been resorting to, governments at various levels, have resorted to some form of grants or debt, debt financing. Now, I want to focus on why debt financing may not be a, a, a reasonable solution. Uh, both from a theoretical perspective and really taking into account some of the empirical evidence. The first is the obvious one. Debt has to be repaid fairly quickly, both in terms of the principal and interest payments, and that imposes a huge burden, especially in times when the crisis, such as the one we face today, is uncertain in terms of how long it will last. So to call upon a borrower to pay back within, let's say, a few months or even a even two years may impose a, an unreasonable burden, indeed, exacerbate the, 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 the existing burden. The second is really a conceptual one that debt, by its very nature, poses what we financial economists call an overhang. And what is this overhang? The overhang takes two forms, and both of them manifest themselves in terms of the incentives faced by the borrower. The first one is really the problem of underinvestment. And that is pretty clear conceptually. If a borrower sees really no hope of actually uh, paying off the full amount of the debt before she or he can recover his own capital, uh, then there is no incentive to work further to, to make the project a success. And this kind of disincentive to perform exists at all levels, whether the household level or the firm level or the bank level. So this is really something that is uh, not creating the right incentives. On the other hand, uh, the, the existence of uh, a debt causes firms to perhaps take on too much risk in some instances. So both these aspects, the underinvestment as well as the, the, uh, the risk shifting, as we call it, are problems due to the overhang of, of debt. So, one of the solutions that we've thought about is really bringing some element of equity financing. Now, of course, Europe has by and large had a bank, has had a, a bank finance kind of industrial structure across all of continental Europe. Indeed, the role of publicly 
uh, finance equity, uh, public equity is relatively modest in Europe, even in relation, not to speak of just the United States or the United Kingdom, but even in terms of some of the emerging market countries. So given this, we proposed an equity-based solution, which is largely based by, on the state taking a stake in several entities, small, medium-sized uh, firms included, uh, with the payback to the state being in the form of enhanced tax payments. So this is a kind of pseudo equity is the correct way to describe this. And that would actually provide the right incentives in our view. I can elaborate if there are questions on this. The second is really the, 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 the uh, need for the European solution. There are many others on this, this panel and in the audience who are much better qualified to speak of the European context. But I'll offer uh, my modest uh, outsider's perspective as someone, an interested outsider, uh, something that is really uh, intriguing to me, uh, particularly having seen uh, the, the, the way the union works in my own native country of India and the way it works in the United States, uh, the role of the, the union. Um, you know, I know the concept of Europe in the modern sense is relatively young. Uh, and it is not often um, fully absorbed uh, into the psyche of the citizens the, that the, 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 the importance of joint action. I think uh, Jacob von Weizsäcker as well as Marco Buti talked about this, but it's really something that is self-evident to me as someone who grew up in the young Indian Union and also witnessing the, with all its... Uh, 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 problems uh, the way the, the imperfect union in the United States works. So I think apart from the usual arguments of diversification across risks, the shock might hit one country more than others, and even a common shock like the pandemic shock ha has had some timing differences, as alluded to by a couple of people, as well as in terms of intensity. And in fact, what should be underscored is the collateral damage caused by the shock, even if a particular country escapes likely, it will not necessarily evade the possibility of aftershocks that come from the fact that one other country has been hit by the shock. I think this is not always fully appreciated. And this is something we see very much at work in the United States. Uh, some, some, some states were early on gloating on the fact that they were not as badly hit, but of course they got hit much worse in the aftermath. And, and some other states that got hit early have now uh, have a little bit of uh, schadenfreude in terms of how other, other uh, states have actually been hit much harder. So the, all this sort of uh, dictates that a joint action actually would work much, much better. While Europe has had a common monetary policy, I'm speaking of the Eurozone uh, for tw uh, two, two decades now, uh, I think it's, it's sort of uh, fiscal action has been fairly sort of piecemeal and the, the new uh, pandemic fund is the first opportunity for sizable joint action. Now, whether this is going to be the model for future financing remains to be seen, but certainly the pandemic has offered a kind of a natural experiment to see how Europe responds to a common shock. I think the fact of the matter is the combined resources of the European Union are certainly amongst the largest in the world, probably even uh, exceed that of the United States potentially. But given the fragmented action, uh, this is not visible. Finally, I want to speak a little bit about the role of banks and how they have been um, hit by the crisis. I think there is not much discussion in the popular press or indeed in academic circles, except here and there, um, about how the banks are going to be affected by the crisis. As we all know, in the aftermath of the, the sovereign debt and Eurozone um, sovereign crises, European banks were hit much harder than banks in any other developed part of the world. Indeed, even in the developing countries, if you take China or India uh, that I'm familiar with, uh, the, the banks are actually, uh, with, with uh, some exceptions, 
are overall in better strength than the banks in the United States, in, in, the, in Europe. Certainly in the United States, banks have been strengthened to a point where there is no immediate kind of uh, risk of a massive kind of uh, shock hitting them. I, I think the situation in Europe is far more parlous in my view. Although uh, the bulk of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the hit has not yet been fully absorbed, unless we find a, a, a solution very quickly through a vaccine or somehow miraculously the, the pandemic abates, I, I fear this, the aftermath of this crisis is going to be with us, uh, especially in the banking system for many years to come. Others alluded to the fact the economy is going to take years to come back to pre-pandemic levels. In my view, the banks will take even longer unless substantial amounts of capital are injected into the banking system. Uh, and I really don't see a huge pool of capital available globally. Some years ago, I was on another panel where I spoke about a trillion dollars of equity capital being required for the bank. And I was laughed at by my fellow panelists. This was actually just after the financial crisis. Uh, and today, the trillion dollars of equity capital for banks around the world seems like a very modest figure. Uh, I think this is really going to be the huge challenge of the future. And this is something that will be discussed, I would say, even after the pandemic subsides. Thank you. So thank you very much, Marty. Uh, there are several questions, and actually I'm inviting uh, all the auditor of this uh, uh, conference to ask other questions. I'm going to sum up some of them and also, you know, uh, present uh, in a synthetic way to our, let's say, panelists. Well, one of the questions that is coming out from, uh, from uh, let's say, the, uh, the audience is that, uh, you know, clearly, uh, and this is for, for Jacob, uh, the, this plan is asking, you know, if we want to have uh, this plan, not just an emergency plan, but something that we remain for, for a long period, it will be a substantial change in the institutional structure of the EU. And uh, the key question is, how are you really planning to implement it? So this is the first question for Jacob. Related to this, the second question that we have in the list is, uh, and is for Marco, uh, you know, it is true that uh, this crisis is not coming from a moral hazard, but clearly it can generate moral hazard. So clearly the question is, how will be the assessment criteria in a way that we are sure that this money will be spent in a good way? And then for Cornelia, you know, um, also from the political point of view, how really should the program be imp implemented in this two level game in a way, you know, that you are having this micro, let's say, approach, but the money are coming from the center and the center is, uh, you know, in a way that from the political point of view, it has been, in some sense, accepted. Because uh, uh, I'm, I'm giving a very simple view from one part of uh, some party in Italy, you know, what they ask is that uh, Europe is giving the money, but then they shouldn't come back and ask how we are spending them because then sovereignty is, uh, is coming back. So I will be happy if Cornelia is able to, to address this point. And, and then uh, uh, later on, I will go back to Marty, but let's start with Jacob. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a very good questions. And uh, let me just start very briefly by saying, yes, of course, there's always moral hazard. The question is, um, do we look at moral hazard as a defining feature of a particular um, situation or not? And I think um, uh, for me, the moral hazard as aspects that we have right now in this crisis, they're, they're not first order of magnitude, they're second or third order of magnitude. But uh, of course, the person asking the question is right. Moral hazard does exist also in this crisis but it's not a defining feature of this crisis. And I think that's a very important point. Um, and uh, so uh, we should always be aware of moral hazard, but uh, should this be the main guide, 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 sort of guidepost to our response? And the answer, I think in this crisis is clearly no. Uh, as a first order approximation, it, it makes a lot of sense to think of this as, as a natural disaster that has come uh, uh, over us collectively. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, um, it's, it, it's, it, it's the job of bureaucrats like Marco and myself to take care of second and third order effects too. Um, on the question um, of uh, how to create a European treasury, um, if it were easy and if everybody knew the answer, I think it, had been done, it, it would have happened already. So it clearly is not easy. But um, I think the point here is we've created um, a, a European um, Union and we've created um, the Euro um, um, in a setup where even the founding fathers um, and, uh, and mothers, uh, I think there were some also founding mothers, um, they um, were aware um, that having um, this extreme version of a monetary union, which is unprecedented, of really having a common currency, but saying on the fiscal side, there is really nothing, almost nothing, that one does on a common basis, that this is consistent in a way, but it um, would, uh, I think the fear by, by many people at the time was it, it would it lead to um, some very ha harsh situations. But I think now we know it's not only harsh situations, it, it, it can lead to dysfunctionality. And, and there was dysfunctionality in the financial crisis. And I think there would have been dysfunctionality in the present crisis if we hadn't come up with something like next generation EU. So um, the other setup that um, we could, of course, imagine, and I think it would be sensible uh, to be there, but it's difficult to get there, is one where we have European uh, Treasury, but with all the necessary checks and balances, so this doesn't um, uh, morph into a, um, a common pool moral hazard nightmare, uh, which of course is always a danger when you do these things, but I think it's entirely possible and other federations are showing this to set it up in a way that works. And now in the middle, in between, sort of between this one relatively harsh uh, incarnation of, of a monetary union and one where you have a, um, a, tr a European treasury with all the, um, the necessary checks and balances, there's a kind of difficult no man's land um, but we need to get across that no man's land to get sort of to the other side. And I don't think there's any sort of in the abstract, there's no, um, there's no obvious course to chart getting from one side to the next. We all know it's a bit of a danger zone. We have to be very, very, very careful in what we do, um, but not doing it, not um, sort of trying to chart the course through that no man's land, and um, I think uh, as, as a European Union, we would not start this project at our peril. And uh, let me add one, uh, one further thought. One may ask the question, because many people know what I've just said. Why didn't we start earlier? Um, uh, and the answer is simple. Because in this balancing act that we need to do between responsibility and solidarity, there was one part uh, of Europe saying, well, we know responsibility and solidarity is all very well, but we absolutely insist on having 10 years of responsibility and maybe one day then we talk about solidarity. And frankly, there's the flip side of people saying, look, um, we need to talk about for at least a decade about solidarity. And then maybe one day we're going to talk about responsibility. And th these two sides were never really able to come together. And one way to interpret what's going on of course, it's not doing justice to the immediate situation, which is very serious and very real. But one way to interpret it is that this is um, a, a, a situation where everybody's showing solidarity is not an abstract concept that may be coming forthcoming 10 or 15 years down the road. There is real readiness for solidarity. Um, and, and I think that's a powerful signal to those who doubt that solidarity and responsibility in the construction of a European treasury will go hand in hand. But having said all of this, uh, the question remains, and it's something that will accompany us, I'm sure for many years to come, how are we going to get to the stable, reasonable situation with the European treasury? And it's, it, it, there's no trivial answer to that. And I, I think we have to, all of us have to work together to make this happen and to make this happen in a way 
um, that, uh, that everybody in Europe in the end can be happy with. Good. Thank you very much. So, Marco, your turn now, the assessment criteria. Thank you very much. No, I think uh, um, indeed very good question. Let me say that uh, uh, very much in line with what uh, Jakub indicated, I think we have uh, the chance really uh, to overcome the, uh, uh, the crystallization of the divide between creditors and debtors, which uh, characterize the response uh, or, or to the financial crisis, which I think left uh, quite a lot of um, uh, no negative legacy uh, there. So um, when one talks about uh, um, uh, uh, solidarity and responsibility and find a good balance, I think we have the chance to do it uh, uh, to do it now, uh, especially if uh, um, there is awareness that the you know the solidarity is um, is uh, has that concept of insurance that we talked about before and reducing uh, the risks at the, at the same time on the part of those uh, traditional on the debtor side is in their own interest is not only in order to please the uh, the creditors. Now, uh, I think the um, using the money properly, as I have tried to outline before, will make a big difference be, uh, of, you know, in the response of, uh, to the crisis and will also determine whether this is a, a large one-off in response to a catastrophic event, but one-off nonetheless or whether this is a change of paradigm in European integration. So I think the responsibility now, having some countries like Germany, you know, cross the Rhine uh, and, uh, uh, you know, shown that uh, uh, supporting a common debt issuance at the European level, supporting um, grants and not only loans, uh, so having made this, uh, this, I think, this shift now has to be comforted by uh, other countries more on the recipient side uh, to, you, to take the responsibility and use the money uh, properly. Now, are they, what is the Commission doing? Uh, I mean, we have issued clear guidance on, uh, to the member states on what we expect them to do and not to do. So, for instance, uh, we have issued the guidance on uh, activities which should not be and could not be financed by um, the uh, recovery and resilient facility uh, because they are uh, against the double transition and in particular the um, environmental uh, transition. So that is uh, so on certain things we cannot uh, that we cannot finance. Uh, second, we have been clear uh, in indicating that uh, the measures that the expansionary measures that they adopt should not lead to debt burden, which is a permanent one. So temporary and targeted rather than permanent measures, I think, should be the name of, uh, um, of the game. So here also, I think, is, uh, uh, is important that we... Um, that we are, we are clear, I think we have issued the guidance and we have insisted in particular on the fact that countries should look at the investment and reform in a, in a combined way. So in terms of clusters. So for each big items, uh, if one thinks about the public administration uh, uh, reform uh, or, um, uh, or uh, other type of, uh, uh, of reforms, think about labor market also, I mean, there is always basically in each one of the of these big items a component which is an investment one, so requiring money, and a component which is reforms, changing the rules of behavior. Uh, so we in um, are pushing member states to organize their um, uh, their national uh, re recovery and resilience programs in terms of these clusters of reforms and investment. And think about the in, uh, as a matrix between uh, uh, of in, the, in, in the conception of the reform uh, of the reform and resilient program, um, uh, you know, reform and investment, 
and, um, and the uh, country-specific recommendations, which address the second R of the recovery and resilience, and uh, the flagships, so the common projects, common objectives that we want to, we want to uh, achieve. So this is the way we address this. It's a fine balance because clearly the, uh, these programs, uh, these national uh, so recovery and resilience plans are not the classic programs that we finance via the ESM during the financial crisis with uh, you know, heavy macroeconomic conditionality. Um, so we, there is, we put the ball very much in the, in the camp of the member states, strong ownership is important, but nonetheless, I think uh, dealing with the resilience element has a, a, a component of reforms which would address you know, the long-term accumulated bottlenecks which uh, prevent the countries from growing and growing in a sustainable manner. Okay, very good. So now Cornelia. Yes, thank you. Let me just uh, take up uh, some of these ideas. I, uh, I think that a good way to think about how we navigate all the way to the future treasury, which would make uh, things easy, is really a, a navigation between Scylla and Charybdis of either too strict oversight or no guidelines whatsoever, the Italian party proposition that you refer to. And there is way, many ways of muddling through exactly these, these two uh, um, uh, poles to avoid. The, uh, and they were already listed. There are some guidelines that are very clear that are given a negative list of things that can't be done. The, the grants were tied to a certain type of activities. Um, so I think we, we we're getting in, in a middle spot that is, uh, it is, that's quite good, but we also see that um, not just for the, uh, the current recovery plan, but for all of these future ne negotiations, the European semester, the multi-annual financial framework, a very crucial question is how exactly you resolve conflict um, that is not going to get us into a space where one member state or several member states can veto uh, and withhold funds and in essence for that country make it feel like the EU is taking that member state hostage because they can block something altogether. And we see right now that the negotiation is moving towards uh, some, some idea of an emergency break rather than a formal veto. I don't know if we're going to get there, but these type of solutions are very intelligent muddling through solutions that help us to extend the discussion, um, but not block and be uh, in the spot that is the strict oversight that we want to avoid. Very good. So now is the turn of Marty, because I want to go back a little bit to you know, the financial system that clearly it is not really part of, of this recovery plan, but uh, on the other side will benefit because if firm uh, will get funding, you know, also banks will uh, have uh, potentially a lower number of non-performing loans. But uh, to Marty, I want to understand, it, the impression is that, at least as a European, is that in the US uh, there is uh, more, uh, let's say, intervention or help uh, to banks rather than instead in, uh, in Europe, the focus were largely directly to small and medium enterprises, firm, householders, and not so much for, for banks. So is it uh, true, this type of perception? And then I clearly I'm asking then also to Jacob and Marco what they are thinking about, uh, you know, how the banking sector and also the financial system can help for this, uh, let's say, recovery plan. But first, Marty. Yes, um, th there are substantial structural differences in the financial systems between uh, U.S. banks and and European banks. First of all, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, US banks emerged from the global financial crisis much stronger than their European counterparts. And that has continued. In fact, I would argue uh, that US banks are even stronger today despite the crisis. And uh, that has happened partly because of many reasons, partly because of regulatory policy, partly because of the monopolistic uh, elements within the structure, the fact that half a dozen banks dominate the US banking system and many other uh, uh, issues relating to consumer protection and so on. But nevertheless, the US banks are in much stronger shape than I would say that the banks of any other uh, part of the world, um, including China for that matter. Uh, now that, that's, that being said also, the U.S. has a fundamentally an equity culture, which is not there in Europe to a large extent. In fact, 
uh, the, the financing of SMEs through any form of equity is out of the question. So perforce, they have to go to the banks. In fact, there is not a substantial public debt market either. So the banks play a much, much more important role in Europe than in the United States. One could argue banks are important, but it's not that every day people wake up and say, what will my bank say? Whereas in Europe, I cannot imagine that a company, large or small, <clears throat> is not thinking about what their bankers would say. So this is, this is extremely important uh, distinction between uh, Europe and the United States. Now, if you take the, the, the initial stimulus, substantial stimulus, uh, in, which was, by the way, surprisingly quickly uh, passed by a, a very fractious um, executive and uh, legislature way back in April, um, and it was substantial, even considering the size of the economy, at a time when nobody knew how deep and, and important this crisis was going to be, the fact of the matter is, despite glitches in the way it was delivered, certainly the line, this is part of the complaint actually, that larger firms got access to these funds very, very quickly. Now, of course, the US was very lucky that the size of the monetary sim stimulus was also substantial. So the money got to the banks very, very quickly. And I, and I think the dispute resolution systems, the US, the FDIC, the, the one that resolves bank, bank uh, failures, also has acted very quickly. In fact, surprisingly, the number of bank failures has been very, very small. It's, you know, we have a lot of banks, so small banks, so that happens sort of all the time. But they are ha it happens so quickly and smoothly that most people simply do not notice, including the depositors of the banks. So the, the, the whole architecture of banking in the United States is completely different. And I want to I hasten to emphasize that it is, cannot be easily copied because it is, it is something that is very peculiar to the United States and it cannot be just borrowed uh, in, in part because it's part of a whole architecture. Okay, so Jacob and Marco. Jacob, do you want to add on, uh, you know, how we are uh, helping or not uh, the banking sector? Yes, no, first of all, um, uh, um, I, I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Martin Sukhoanian, for, for pointing um, to the differences between um, uh, um, the banking system in the US and in Europe. And uh, uh, I agree with you that the banking system in the US has man many advantages, um, and um, uh, not least with regards to resilience, but for the characteristics, the style of facts has given us in Europe, and it's not so easily copied. Um, uh, in view of that, in light of that, um, uh, what we're seeing um, throughout Europe, and I can certainly um, go into a little bit of detail in Germany, is that as part of our stimulus package is we have a very important element. We have three pillars. One is sort of supply side, one is demand side, and one is transformative. And I think it's good that these three pillars, but let me zoom a little bit into the supply side pillar. It's not your classic supply side policies. It has a lot to do with uh, um, providing liquidity support, but also equity support via the public balance sheet, um, which uh, first of all helps uh, uh, companies uh, in the real economy weather the storm. And secondly, of course, is an indirect help uh, to banks because it means that their exposure um, is, is much less serious than it would be otherwise. Um, and so uh, um, given uh, the stylized fact, facts that you've mentioned, um, our, our, our support measures, both uh, in liquidity terms, um, a lot of public guarantees for bigger businesses, 80% or even 90% guaranteed by governments. And then of course, um, the credits, additional credits handed out by um, by the banks, um, uh, and, and this is all organized by K KW, but I don't want to go into the details. And um, for smaller businesses, uh, and sometimes even 100% the government guarantee, plus a lot of um, equity enhancing measures. And the, um, uh, the most important uh, in, in terms of volume is, of course, uh, our short time work scheme. Um, where companies uh, um, are able to basically convert um, a fixed cost of their wage bill into a variable cost without sacking people. So it's a good deal for employees and it really protects uh, the equity, the, the, the capital in, 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 com in, in companies. 
And then, of course, the individual support measures geared towards uh, uh, sectors that are particularly badly hit um, where they get grants. Um, uh, and we just launched a huge program for our November lockdown um, uh, targeting uh, those companies directly uh, affected or very closely affected, but indirectly um, by, by the lockdown and, and uh, um, uh, providing them with grants to cushion the blow. So, so these are in, in a way reactions to what Martin said, because it would be unwise to simply rely on um, bankrupt companies um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, and non-performing loans, sorting themselves out quickly and pretending there was no friction. There would be a lot of friction and that's why we're doing what we're doing. But to the extent possible, that's my last point, don't worry, to the extent possible, um, we, we try to condition our support on companies having been in good financial standing in 2019, so that we do not end up in a situation where those companies that uh, simply do not have a sound business model uh, um, because of the COVID-19 crisis um, uh, uh, receive a sort of eternal life without being, uh, uh, without being on sound footing. Uh, but th that's a balancing act, of course, uh, but that's very much on our minds and, and many of the measures, the support measures we're taking are conditioned on companies having had a sound business model before the crisis hit. Thank you. Okay, Marco? Yes, thank you very much. I would like to thank Marty as well because he puts the uh, finger on an important point. Uh, look, let me say, first of all, um, at the European level, so next generation EU and the recovery and resilience facility is not for helping financial firms. So that is uh, not covered by the um, by the program. This does not mean that the problem uh, that Marty uh, highlights are, uh, are, are uh, um, not relevant. Actually, they are, they, they are relevant indeed. So we have to be prepared also uh, when it will come to the post-emergency where uh, a number of um, firms are going to uh, inevitably go bust to have uh, to to assess also the impact on the uh, on the banks okay let me say that first of all i agree that um, uh, with the assessment that the um, european banks have uh, they say exited the financial crisis uh, uh, not as strong as the uh, us banks uh, nonetheless i mean if one takes uh, a pers an intertemporal perspective, we can, uh, I mean, in terms of capitalization, in terms of other indicators of balance sheet solidity, European banks are certainly in a much better position than they were before the financial uh, crisis. So I think is uh, we start from, um, from a position which is uh, stronger. And uh, during the periods of between nine, uh, 2014 to before, uh, the eruption of the COVID crisis, uh, um, also non-performing loans have been reduced very, very substantially, uh, clearly in a differentiated way between countries, but certainly they have come out, uh, uh, come down uh, uh, a lot. So, uh, so I don't want to belittle the problem uh, um, at all, but the, um, let's say we are in a better position that we were during the financial crisis uh, in the commission in the course of December, will come uh, up with proposals uh, on uh, um, an MPL uh, action plan, which will deal with some of the, uh, of the issues. You have seen also uh, proposals uh, which are uh, clearly not uncontroversial on asset management companies uh, at the European level or a network of national asset management companies, which may, you know, will, which is important, to, you know, the important discussion to see what, where to go from here. Um, I asked before whether this uh, uh, is a big one-off or a paradigm shift. Uh, I believe that um, we will be in the second uh, position uh, if we are able to reopen um, negotiations on uh, areas which, uh, on which we had quite a lot of troubles uh, during the financial crisis in the past years. 
um, which, are re- which are relevant for what we are discussing. I mean, capital market union, we have put forward proposals on that, and also banking union, where, which, in which we are in the middle of the, of the river. We are uh, um, finalizing, uh, hopefully very quick, very soon, the um, second pillar, uh, so the backstop for the banking union, but the uh, deposit guarantee is still to be, you know, to be negotiated. So it is going to be important, I think, to show that this potential overcoming of the division between creditors and debtors uh, translates also into concrete progress uh, on uh, on the banking uh, union uh, uh, side. I think capital market union is essential because uh, uh, it is clear that we are not going to be to jump to an equity, uh, full equity culture as the U.S. Uh, overnight, but we have to be aware that, uh, um, first of all, an equity-based solutions are uh, more robust than debt-based solution. Very much agreed with uh, the uh, what uh, Marty indicated before. But also, crucially, if one thinks thinks about the, the double transition, so digital and uh, uh, climate, a uh, climate transition, it's very difficult to believe that that those type of investments which are um, short on collateral but rich on ideas and prospects could be financed simply by loan by you know bank borrowing so i think we have to make progress on that uh, on the front and there is a long way uh, to go but we will achieve that transformative uh, Im- impulse that we discussed before only if we make progress in, in building a capital market union, which is, um, which is a well-functioning one. Okay, so thank you very much. You know, we are running a little bit out of time, but I have just the last question for Cornelia that is coming, you know, among the different Q&A that we have. You know, there are a lot of other questions that I'm not able to address. Uh, one, for example, is uh, how much is the net effect of, uh, you know, having this uh, EU intervention versus having the national intervention. But one that is for Cornelia is the following, you know, there is all this concern of this public intervention. And the question that is posed there is, are we moving versus a socialism uh, socialist area rather than, you know, a capitalist area. So that all this is public intervention. How do you see it from the, from the political point of view? Well, this, this uh, question makes me smile because it reminds me of the presidential campaign in the United States where everybody was throwing around so- socialism with very a few definitions of what that actually means. And I think uh, in a way it would have to, I would have to ask, well, what is socialist intervention here? But I think what we can see, let me put it this way, is that we are uh, in an era now where we are affirming principles quite strongly that haven't featured uh, as much in previous debates and, and, and they're different moral principles than what we've seen. We, we talk a lot about solidarity now and responsibility and we affirm them as something that goes together. We've also added an entirely new component and that is the defense of European values. And I think that is a very interesting um, element that helps us move into something that is not pitting one country against another. We, Of course, we also talk about the frugal four and uh, apparently some lavish expansionary countries somewhere in the South. We've all seen the cover of the Dutch magazine that is opposed to the Macron Merkel proposal by depicting that even in images. When, when we have these country against country divisions that are mobilized at the national level, things very quickly get ugly. What we now have is moral categories that are that are turning around the principles of solidarity and responsibility and everybody can subscribe to them to some degree. And we have a principle which is now the defense of European values such as the rule of law. And we've all seen that this is what uh, made yesterday such a frustrating day for all participants because Hungary and Poland vetoed specifically this ambition. And that's also what uh, makes a lot of the discussion in the European Parliament so so tense. But I think um, moral categories will always be a feature of political life because they incorporate what is desirable, what is not. It's the essence of politics. And the fact that we're now discussing these common uh, moral values that we would like to have is a very, very reassuring. As a political scientist, I can only be excited about the 
about the vote yesterday, but it's a very it's a reassuring feature about the normal course of politics. And I think it's very interesting, let me just highlight it, but Hungary and Poland vetoing on the rule of law yesterday shows you that somebody who can be a net beneficiary is willing to shoot himself in the foot or in the knee or whatever, just to not be politically pushed on some something that the EU collectively says that they want to defend. So clearly here we have a political moment that is not just the, the bean counting, who's a beneficiary, who is, who is not. That is normal in politics. It's interesting to me, maybe it's not as exciting to everybody else. And I, I feel for the, the people who had to live through the frustrating negotiations yesterday, but at least that gives us the room to politically negotiate something that is shared rather than one country against another that we've seen in the past. So I think that, you know, this is the better way to finish. I really hope that uh, what you are saying will happen, you know, and we are moving forward in a new dimension of the European Union. So let me thank all the panelists and clearly also all the participants that remains even if we, sp we were late. So thank you very much to all of you. And I'm inviting you for the next meeting uh, of this, let's say, conference, Frankfurt conference that we are having uh, in, in four different meetings because of the situation. And I hope that next year we will be instead all in presence. So thank you very much, Jacob, Marco, Cornelia, and Marty. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.